uh, his new book uh, entitled His Hiding Place is Darkness, a Hindu Catholic Theopoetics of Divine Absence. I know many of you have your own copy of the book, but we have uh, two copies uh, that I'm going to pass around. So as many of you know, uh, this is part of the series, the last of the series this year um, on faculty books um, that uh, the committee, uh, I'm sorry, the Center for the Study of World Religion sponsors under Frank's uh, leadership. And Frank's is the last book uh, appropriately uh, this year that we'll celebrate. Uh, basically, the program tonight is that uh, after I introduce Frank, here you will uh, come up and say 15 or uh, 20 minutes of uh, comments on uh, how he came to conceive of the book, what he was uh, attempting to achieve, and so forth. At that point, we will have three respondents whom I will introduce uh, one by one. Uh, and um, after all that's done, we'll open it up to, to you uh, for conversation. And after uh, our discussion ends at 7 o'clock sharp, there will be a reception across the street at the Center for the Study of world religions, okay? So since the author of the book we're celebrating tonight is well known to us all, I'll keep my introductory remarks brief. Parkman, professor of divinity and professor of comparative theology, and since 2010, director of the Center for the Study of World Religions, Frank joined the faculty of the Divinity School in 2005. After earning his doctorate in South Asian languages and literatures at the University of 19... Uh, at the University of Chicago in 1984. He taught at Boston College for 21 years before coming to Harvard. His primary areas of scholarship, as many of you will know, are theological commentarial writings in the Sanskrit and Tamil traditions of Hindu India and the developing field of comparative theology. He's also written on the Jesuit missionary tradition, particularly in India, and the dynamics of dialogue in the contemporary world. Frank is a Roman Catholic priest and a member of the Society of Jesus and blogs regularly in the All Things section of America Magazine online. In July 2010, he was elected a fellow of the British Academy, and he's currently also a professorial research fellow at the Australian Catholic University. Frank is the author of numerous articles and books, of which uh, I can name just a few here, in addition to the book that's circulating now. Uh, there is The New Comparative Theology, Inner Religious Insights from the Next Generation, published in 2010, Comparative the uh, Theology, Deep Learning Across Religious Borders, published by Blackwell in 2010, The Truth, The Way, The Life, Christian Commentary on Three Holy Mantras of the Sri Nisth. Sri Vaisnava tradition. I was just saying if you knew that. I know that. But <laughs> from the Sri Vaisnava Hindus. So with that, Frank, I will uh, let you. Please join me in welcoming Frank. Thank you all for coming. And thank you, Kevin, for your kind introduction. Um, it's unusual for me to be in the position of speaking, because I usually am introducing the speaker. And I will try to follow the command that I give to everyone who speaks here, stay within your time limit. So, Basically, 15 minutes to talk about how I came to write this book and put it before you. And I'll be very grateful to hear from our discussants what they think and then to hear from all of you. So the book, His Hiding Place is Darkness, a Hindu Catholic poetics, theopoetics of divine absence, really begins some 35 years ago when I first began in the University of Chicago uh, in my early part of my doctoral program with A.K. Ramanujan who was chair of the department at that time, to read the Tamil devotional literature. So he was working on a book at that time about this text called Tiruvaimori, which I translate as the holy word of mouth in the book, and a beautiful set of 1,100 verses in Tamil, devotional verses, kind of in a linked garland, where each verse ends with the first word of the next, and the last word of the whole is the first word of the entire text dedicated to the god Vishnu, sometimes in the forms of Krishna, Rama, and other uh, incarnations or avatars of the deity. And reading this poetry in 1981, 82, 83 in India, I became instantly, you might say, enthralled by it. 
uh, with some of the most beautiful poetry I've yet to encounter in any language. And I think over the years, these 35 years or so since first reading it, I've gone back to it again and again. And in some ways, when I set the task for myself, how did this book came, come about, it came about in this kind of moment of discovery, there in a graduate program, working really on another set of materials related to Sanskrit literature, it's another story, finding this lovely poetry as enthralling and engaging. And my book, this book, began there as well. I also found early on, and again, A.K. Ramanujan and Norman Cutler and others at the University of Chicago were very helpful to me in getting started, was richly embedded in a commentarial tradition. And the more I began to read of these early commentators in the 12th and 13th, 14th century, writing in South India, what they were really doing that really, for me, was um, indispensable in opening my understanding of these materials was reading every word, every verse, opening the meaning both in terms of the immediate poetry and then all the parallels in uh, mythology, in the epic, in ritual practice, in philosophical text and the like. And it became this just kind of vaster and vaster world of commentary that continues to today. People are still writing this poetry and writing about it. And I think from that early stage on, where does the book come from? The book comes from a sense of being truly engaged in this reading process. That having picked up the text, read it in Tamil, translated it, worked on it in various ways, I felt myself being drawn again and again back to it. The devotional poetry, something like the Psalms in the Bible, but also mixed in with appropriately, in this case, the Song of Songs in the Bible, uh, some text philosophical, some in the form of debate, uh, many of them in the form of a young woman speaking in love for her absent lover. So many of these texts came up again and again and began to fill my imagination as I was taught by the teachers of the tradition. The challenge then in the 80s, but then in the 90s when I first started to write about this material, was how do you write about such beautiful poetry? What do you say that is in any way additional or worthy to be added to the poetry itself? And then how do you do it in English? Uh, how do you go from the original language into a translation? And what are you expecting your reader to get from how you write? So over the years, I've tried in various ways to, to explain the material, put it in the historical context, read it according to other texts. But I always felt that the challenge really was to go deeper and sort of see where the poetry is drawing us. Uh, what it's calling us to is, as as de devotees in the tradition will recite it again and again and celebrate it in temple practice and eventually a whole world kind of infused with this poetry of love of Vishnu, love of Krishna, um, played out in so many different ways that I needed to be able to write from that experience and write from there and speak from there. And I've tried this in various ways over the years. I've tried it... Um, in 1996 in a book called Seeing Through Texts, uh, 2008 a book called Beyond Compare, um, and over and over again coming back to it, and I felt that I was really being challenged to, to go deeper. The second stage of this, realizing that I didn't begin from nowhere. I didn't begin from kind of a zero point as a scholar, but rather was already deeply embedded in a tradition of devotion, of interpretation, of commentary, of preaching, of engagement, namely my own Roman Catholic tradition. And I suspect that one of the reasons this poetry of a ninth century South Indian poet, Namalvar, was so attractive to me with its commentarial traditions and its place in temple worship was that I was able to recognize something of my own tradition and that it was not unfamiliar, but it echoed in some way, not by historical connection, not by influence, uh, not even by a certain theoretical kind of parallel, but rather simply there was a resonance of recognition, finding in this poetry something that pushed me back into my own tradition. So over the years, I've tried many different ways to read this poetry with examples from Christian and Catholic tradition. But particularly in this book, I went to the poetry that spoke most directly to the experience of the woman separated from her beloved, uh, the power of this relationship dramatically enacted 
where the woman sought her lover and could not find him in the night, namely to the Song of Songs. And while the Song of Songs is many different things, and there are scenes of intense union as well as separation, I found that what I was intensely interested in <clears throat> was those moments when the lover was not present and the lover was absent. And because of a strong sense of tradition in my Roman Catholic tradition, I also found that I wanted to read it with interpreters in the tradition. I don't know Hebrew. I couldn't read it properly with the rabbis. But I did want to dig into tradition and found that the medieval tradition of Christian commentary, uh, particularly the sermons of Bernard of Clairvaux, Gilbert of Hoyle, and John of Ford, who together write about 250 sermons that cover the eight chapters of the song, were intensely bringing out the inner power of this text. And it seemed to me right and appropriate by a certain kind of analogy, a certain kind of comparative logic, to read the Tiruvai Mori, the Holy Word of Mouth, with its commentators, with the Song of Songs, with these medieval sermon writers in the monastic setting. And it's really out of that experience that the book began. I also found that in doing this, what I really wanted to do was show a better way of how one does comparative theology. That in many circles, we talk about comparative study of religion, we talk about the history of religions, and there are all kinds of ways in which this is properly done. And I think we learn from all of these ways but I found particularly in church circles, I might say, and also in, in Hindu Vaishnava traditions in South India, that sometimes there's a fear of comparison, a fear that comparing and reading with the other will water down, diminish, detract, make less what is unique to our tradition. And I wanted to be able to show that in fact it could be the opposite dynamic that the two traditions in a sense magnify one another and make one another come more deeply and intensely to life. And so in choosing to read these commentaries of the South Indian tradition, uh, Nanjir, Nampillai, with uh, the holy word of mouth, Tiruvai Mori, and reading Bernard of Clairvaux, Gilbert of Hoyle, and John of Ford, with the Song of Songs, that the best place to go in terms of making this a more intense project were precisely those scenes of absence. So that's where the title of the book comes from, is Hiding Places, Darkness, John of Ford, in one of his comments, uh, sermons on a passage of the song, talks about there are those moments in our lives when God is intensely present. And then more terrible than anything are the moments when the beloved is gone. And one cannot imagine how this could take place. It reminds me of the psalm, his hiding place is darkness. And that stuck with me early on in the working on the book and eventually became the title of the book. So looking for kind of a place, not an apophatic theology, uh, not a discussion about the absence or presence of God, uh, not a symbolization of God or finding God in the modern world, but rather those experiences that some people have of a beloved who comes and goes, who is present, who withdraws, and how to write about and think about that dynamic. So that's sort of the, the dynamic of the book, reading these two traditions together, a certain kind of comparative theology driven by a certain kind of of intense problem that I was trying to get into. This, uh, another stage of the writing of the book was really, okay, what do you do with all of this in terms of making a book? And one thing to do is not to do a book at all, just, just read the material. Um, as people in the tradition do, just read it, then read it again, read it again, read it again, and that's it. And even if you read back and forth between traditions, just do that. But I really wanted to, um, in a sense, make a claim on the academic context and make a claim on a university press, and make a claim on how we study religion by saying that this can be done in a way that Stanford University Press will publish. So how do you do that? For me, it became kind of a, an effort at discipline, purification, asceticism, cutting things down, and seeing how far I could go with that and get away with it in the context of writing a book. So what I love to do, and did in this case, once I've finished in complete manuscript, I kept revising and revising and revising and cut it by about 25%. Um, somehow taking out the things that are distracting and unnecessary. Partly because of my anxiety about not knowing Hebrew and not being able to read the song in the original, I have uh, had a lot of, of secondary sources about the Song of Songs in the text, in the chapters. And while that material needs to stay there, as kind of positioning it in terms of how to understand this text, 
in its original setting, I shifted it all into the footnotes. So there's a long section of notes at the end of the text. And I felt what was the point was that those who wanted to go there and wanted to read about those problems were welcome to turn to the back of the book, but that those who simply wanted to stay with the story, the coming and going of the beloved, could also do so without tripping over all the academic frame that is so important, but nonetheless I thought didn't need to be in the way, so I put it into the back. And over and over again, I also removed um, further questions that could be raised. So, so many times along the way in writing the book, people would say to me, well, actually, why don't you take a year? I mean, you're not stupid. You could learn Hebrew. You can read it in the Hebrew. Uh, take time out to do that. Why not do that? Um, but I didn't. Um, or you're reading Bernard of Clairvaux. Uh, why not consult Professor Madigan about Bernard of Clairvaux in the Middle Ages? And um, I talked to Beverly Kinsley, Professor Kinsley, once about sermons in the Middle Ages. Uh, they could go off a chapter or two on that. Um, all the things that have not yet been written about South Indian Tamil poetry and the Vaishnava tradition, I didn't go there either. Um, somebody said to me again and again, why don't you write about John of the Cross <clears throat> and his canticle, which in some way picks up on the same themes. I didn't go there either. And I think just, to, we can talk about this later, but one of the things about writing a book is all the books you don't write in the course of writing your book and all the things you leave out. And there's a loss and there's uh, perfectly other good other books that could be written that aren't written because everything is somehow truncated, focused. And I'd like to think it's, it's a kind of loss, but it's a merited loss by the fact that you, you do know what you want to do and you keep going there. And what I put in the book um, to indicate how I thought it might best be read, and if you see it going around, are before I talk about any of the passages from the Holy Word of Mouth or the Song of Songs, in any of the, the long extended discussions using the commentators and so on, I just give the text side by side in sections called For Meditation. And the idea was that um, insofar as it's possible in translation, possible in this kind of book, that the reader I wanted to leave to the reader, you read it for yourself. You read in my English translation, the Tiruvai Mori, you read uh, the traditional um, Douay translation of the Song of Songs, which has a certain poetry to it. Read these texts together and see what you find. Almost as if to say, let's stop the reading along the way. Uh, let's find ways to not simply read through the book, or worse yet, skip to the last page and see what the last page says, but rather find our way into it and stop. Read slowly. Don't read fast. Uh, because I think a book that you can read more slowly sometimes can be all the more a better experience. I mean, all of this, I would say, is an exemplification of how to do comparative theology. Um, it's not, you know, there's not much in the book about comparative theology, which is my field. And I deliberately, I think, say in one of the little notes near the beginning of it, um, I won't talk about this discipline any longer, but rather the book itself is comparative theology. See how I do it, that's it. And we can talk about this, whether this works or not. Two other points I'll make, and then I'll stop. Um, one would be, I've been very concerned in what I've been saying up to now about how do you write such a book, and the choices you make, and how you put things together uh, section by section. I was also concerned about what do you expect your readers to get out of it? Um, what is it that you're putting before the reader? And one thing I've already said is trying to provi provide these kind of oases of quiet throughout the book, these four meditation sections where the reader can feel permission just to stop. But I also wanted to go further and, and to think about this problem because the Song of Songs is poetry. The Tiruvai Mori, Holy Word of Mouth, is poetry. And how do you write prose about poetry without killing the poetry? Because again, in one sense, you just have the poetry. You read it. You, don't need, you sing it. You don't need anything else. But how do you talk about it in a way that doesn't flatten it and beat it down. And this is where I became interested in the, the uh, you know, flailing about through any number of modern contemporary poets, uh, looking into how poets write and how poets talk about their poetry, and came up with the poetry of Jory Graham, our Pulitzer Prize winning uh, poet uh, here at Harvard, who wrote, writes, uh, continues to write such powerful poetry, which tries to kind of take the problem of how do you read poetry 
how do you read it aloud? How do you see the lines of poetry? And if you've ever read her poetry, it kind of, it's always falling off the edge of a line. It's full of uh, slashes and dots and parentheses and brackets and so on like that. Almost making it impossible to read, I think in order that the reader will have to stop and say, what am I doing? And I found her way of writing poetry and then some of the interviews that have been done with her and many interviews available, really talking about the problem of using words to talk about overly powerful experiences and writing in such a way that the poetic experience is not normalized, regularized, and said, oh, I think I'll read a book of poetry, but rather that there's a certain kind of um, enactment of the problem, speaking the problem, hearing it read aloud, that in a sense puts you on edge. And I found her poetry very particularly interesting out of all the poets I might have looked at. And in the, in the first part of the book, I used uh, her poem, Le Manteau de Pascal, uh, in which she talks about this story about when Pascal, René Pas uh, Pascal was buried, he had um, sewn in the corner of his garment a proof of God's existence. And that years later, when people came to look for it, the garment had kind of shredded and fragmented, and the proof wasn't there anymore. And that somehow the poet writes things down, and it begins to fragment almost as soon as it's written and gets lost. And so she kind of weaves in and out of this theme over the course of this long poem. And at the end of it, fascinating to me as a Jesuit, uh, she quotes from Gerard Manley Hopkins, the great Jesuit poet. Um, not from his poetry, but from a journal where he's talking one day about reading, doing some study of leaves and studying the veins of the leaves, the, the shape of the leaf, getting into finer, finer points of the leaf. And then suddenly says, it was either this day or the next when I realized I could no longer remain in the Anglican church. And it's somehow in that particularity, he suddenly realized that the life he was living was not meant for him anymore. And from there went and found his way into the Catholic Church and into the Jesuits. But I was fascinated by the immense particularity of the reading and her reading of Hopkins. And then she echoes those lines, the impossibility of staying where I am, come back again and again in the poem. Or in the last part of the book, I, the other example, the taken down God. Uh, one of her poems that she, again, puts herself on the edge. She's at a small church in a village in Italy on Holy Saturday. And she's there as a poet. She's in the church taking notes, watching the devotions of the people with the corpus that's been taken down from the cross. And then suddenly is self-conscious saying, what am I doing sitting here writing in my notebook in the face of the devotion of these people? And she runs outside and sits on the steps. And then she's saying, what am I doing out here when I should be in there with them? And she said, who in the world needs another damn poem? What is exactly this for? And so she kind of struggles back and forth, struggles back and forth. I found that fascinating, this kind of sense of faith and belief and belonging on the edge of despair, and that this was something like what I was finding in the Song of Songs and the Holy Word of Mouth. So that's what I weave into the book at the beginning and the end, her uh, poetry. And the final thing I did, um, because I believe that this kind of work, well, it can be many things, is in fact theological, in a strong sense. Um, in my case, it's Christian theological, it's Roman Catholic theological, is how to signal back to people in the Christian and then the Catholic community, this is not simply a comparative study of poetry that is meant for a solely academic audience, but rather has a place in the church. And so for that, I went to the, um, the very well-known, very prestigious, very important 20th century Catholic theologian, Hans Urs von Balthasar, uh, one of the great solid figures of the 20th century, a favorite of various popes. And nobody could complain that von Balthasar was not 102% Catholic theologian. <laughs> um, so he's right there in the center of the tradition and saying, he's mine. Um, he's not for conservatives. He's not for people afraid of comparative work. He's not for people who have nothing to learn from other religions. He's mine. And how is he mine? Because he wrote 15 volumes of about 400 pages each, spelling out the beautiful, the good, and the true. He started at the end, uh, wrote a volume on theology, realized that how can you do theology if you have no sense of the aesthetic 
or the moral. So he went back and said, let me do a volume on aesthetics, um, Herlikite, The Glory of the Lord, which became seven volumes. His reading, particularly of poetry, uh, both from the tradition and contemporary uh, 19th, 20th century poetry. And then the story of salvation, the narrative, the epic, is not simply a flat thing that's always the same, but it happens, it keeps happening. And therefore he did a theodramatics on top of his theopoetics and did five thick volumes of theodramatics. And then said, okay, now that I've done all these volumes, I can finish my trilogy. And he did two more volumes of theology, particularly on the spirit of God at work in the world. And this struck me as a, a fascinating kind of deferral of theology, deferral of system, deferral of trinity, deferral of the doctrine of the spirit and the church by saying, go back into the beauty of the poetry, the art. Go back into the drama, the uncertain drama of human condition, of God in the world, which to me resonated perfectly well with the Song of Songs and the Holy Word of Mouth. So again, I, I kind of bracket the book in terms of the structure of using von Balthasar, kind of in conversation with Jory Graham, to understand and read the great drama that this book is trying to evoke and, and offer it to the reader. Um, the last thing I do, and almost the last thing I'll say, is that, um, and I'm sort of amazed and grateful that the press let me get away with it, the book doesn't have chapters, but it has um, acts. So first act, second act, third act, and then, and those are basically the readings of the texts with a prologue and an epilogue. So it kind of has a, an obviously dramatic uh, structure to it. And then the theoretical trap chapters where I read Balthazar and Graham and so on like that are the entracts. So you have the interludes between the acts. You know, um, again, the press, I thought the press would say, no, you can't do that. Uh, but they did say, sure, you can do that. Trying to evoke this experience. The last thing I would say, um, and then I will sit down, is that again, it, it tried to make it as attractive and inviting as I could to do justice to the poetry. But also back to where I started, that this kind of resonance is deep inside myself as a Christian, as a believer, as a disciple of Christ, to make that mean something that could be talked about in the academic world. Uh, not in terms of flat presence, not in terms of sovereignty, not in terms of just imposing it, but a God who hides, a God who's absent, a God who's constantly being lost, is something very powerful. And I thought that trying to do this as a Christian would be a contribution to all these elements of poetry, comparison, and so on, but also um, a statement about how to talk about God in the 21st century. Now, whether I did that, we have several wonderful discussants. Uh, I'll leave it up to them to decide, but thank you. Well, first of all, Frank, thanks for not asking me about Bernard of Clairvaux. I've never heard of the guy. Uh, I actually know more about the Sri Vaishnava tradition than I do about Bernard of Clairvaux. So. Uh, so let me introduce now our first respondent uh, to Frank's book, um, Professor Catherine Cornell from Boston College, where she's a professor and chairperson of the theology department. Uh, Professor Cornel obtained her PhD from the Catholic University of Louvain in 18, 1989. Uh, <laughs> prior to coming to Boston College, she was Associate Professor of Comparative Religion at the Catholic University of Louvain. She's lectured at universities all over the world. Her research interests focus on the theology of religions, the theory of interreligious dialogue, concrete questions in the Hindu, Christian, and Buddhist Christian dialogues, and the phenomenon of interculturation and intercultural theology. Uh, as I scan her publications here, I'm relieved to say I think I can pronounce all the words in uh, some of the most recent ones. Uh, among her most recent books are Theories, Theory and Methods in Comparative Religion, uh, Women in World Religions, um, Women and Interreligious Dialogue, 2013, The Wiley Blackwell Companion to Interreligious Dialogue. Dialogue, Wiley Blackwell, 2013, The World Market and Interreligious Dialogue, Whip and Stock, 2011, and on it goes. So, Professor Camille, great to have you here. Thank you. Thank 
Thank you very much for this introduction, and thank you, Frank, for, uh, for your introduction. I think that was really helpful for those who haven't read the book to get a sense of the uh, complexity and the layeredness of the book. It's really very hard to, uh, to evoke. First of all, I want to say how humbled I am to uh, give a response to this wonderful book, because I see many people here in the audience who would be who are much more experts, uh, certainly in the Hindu tradition, than I am, and uh, who would have been great respondents. So I'm humbled to have been invited, um, but very happy to say a few things uh, in praise of this book, and then raise also a few questions that I have, and that will come mostly from my own expertise, which is um, the method in comparative uh, theology. <clears throat> First, about the book. Um, I think I've read all of Frank's books, and, <laughs> and this is really my favorite book. Um, I think this is his most uh, personal book, his most self-revealing book. Um, it's a book that I think uh, contains a kind of testimony that is, uh, that is very moving. It's very clear that the, the texts that Frank deals with in this, in this book are texts that touch him very deeply, very personally and that sort of unlock in him also a kind of voice and a, and a poetry that, uh, that comes through in the writing of this book. So at a certain point in the book he says, I'm not a poet, but I'm writing about poetry, but I think it's, it's really a very poetic book. His own writing is, is, is just as poetic as the text that he writes about. So it's really a very beautiful book, a uh, very uh, uh, enjoyable <laughs> book uh, to read. Um, what I always get out, out of Frank's work is also the way he weaves things together. I think in his presentation he also mentioned how he brings in contemporary authors. He brings in Hans Urson Balthasar, uh, Gerald Manley Hopkins, Anne Carson, uh, Jory Graham. So I feel like when I read Frank's work, I'm always sort of in a roller coaster and being introduced to a number of, of authors that I haven't uh, read or haven't known about and that are very... Uh, eye-opening and revealing. So, um, but th with that also often comes a question of why this person and not, not someone else. And that's, I think, something that Frank himself raised. You know, you, you, you always have to cut, you always have to choose. You can't write about everything. And, and the choices he makes are, are certainly always pertinent, but, 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 it, but they always refer beyond themselves to other possibilities that haven't been included in the book. And, and, and that raise uh, those kinds of questions. Um, so from, from his presentation, I think we've, we've seen that the book has many layers and it can be approached and reflected upon from any uh, number of perspectives. Um, it can be looked at as a work of Indological scholarship. Um, Frank gives original translations of many of these texts and that's a major contribution, I think, to the field of Indology. So, just on that count, I think it's, it's an important contribution to uh, Indology. It can be looked at as work of historical theology when you look at all the different authors that he brings in, the commentaries that he brings to the text and the different layers of commentaries. I'm sure historical theologians will also be very interested in looking at, at this work and, and what they can uh, draw from it. I'm not an Indologist, I'm not a historical theologian, um, but I will be looking at, at it maybe from uh, the, uh, as a work of the theology of religions and comparative theology. So first, as a work of theology of religions, I think um, it's a, a text that, uh, that is in many ways uh, more revealing than many of his other works in terms of theology of religions. Uh, for those of you who aren't in the field, theology of religions is, is a discipline of theology that reflects on the theological presuppositions for engaging in comparative theology. So it looks at questions of truth and salvation and how and why to engage in interreligious dialogue or in comparative theology. And Frank has always been sort of notoriously reticent uh, to meddle in the discussions of, of, of theology of religions. Um, but I think that, that this book, more than many of his other works, really show where he comes from in terms of his theology of religions. I think it's very clear in this book that, that there's uh, underlying his writing a de very deep faith indeed that God speaks in many ways and in many religious traditions and touches the heart 
of people in, in all religious traditions and that there is some truth and something to be learned from uh, all of these uh, religious traditions. Um, whether or not there is any hierarchy in religious traditions and so on doesn't come out in this book and never comes out in any of Frank's writings. Uh, but there's, there's very, uh, in, on, on the other hand, I think there's a real testimony to the, the presence of God and of the spirit in, in other religious traditions. And that is theology of religions that is implied in all of his work and I think comes out very uh, clearly in this uh, text. Um, as a work of comparative theology, I will come back to that when I, when I raise uh, a few questions, but one uh, dimension of Frank's work that this book in particular brought out to me is that it's also a work of pastoral theology. Uh, and I think in the last comments that Frank made, this, uh, this also came out in the sense of how this, this text is also a, a way of speaking about God and testifying to his faith uh, in the contemporary world and, and uh, trying to speak about God in, in new ways. So there's something, I think, pastoral also uh, about this, this, uh, this book, and it's something uh, that, that, I've, uh, that I notice more in, in this text maybe than in any of, uh, <clears throat> of his previous work. And that also relates to how I, I suddenly understand him doing comparative theology. Uh, sometimes, you know, in, in the past, I, I have been more critical about the choice of texts or, or how to do comparative theology and how to justify the texts that one brings into comparison with one another. Or at least I've always wondered about why this text, not that text, and so on. And here, you know, I've, I've uh, come to understand that it's, it's really not random, uh, his choice of texts, that there is really something that touches him personally and spiritually and a question that he is uh, pondering himself and that brings him to a particular text. And he doesn't, he doesn't really talk about these kinds of issues. I mean, I think they came out maybe a little bit um, in his talk here, but the kind of itinerary of why this particular text, that it, it really has to do with a very deep personal spiritual commitment and conviction and experience and, uh, and so this kind of aspect of, of the pastoral that's also part of, of his text of, of testifying to something that is very central and very important in his life I think uh, comes out very clearly in, in, his, in this book and, and I found very moving. Um, I, I'd like to uh, develop a few questions that have to do with comparative theology since that's all I know. Um, <coughs> and uh, that have to do with uh, the um, place of the comparative theologian between uh, the two traditions. Um, on the one hand, Frank is always in this book and in other, uh, other books always insistent that he comes to comparative theology as a Catholic theologian from a Christian tradition, as a Jesuit, with a clear commitment to the person of Jesus Christ, and so that's very clear in, in, his in his text, in this text, as well as in his other texts. On the other hand, he also writes about uh, a sense of homelessness, I think, of, of the theologian who does uh, comparative theology. Uh, on page 64, he speaks of the lonely place of the comparative theologian. Um, on page 86, he says, the more they, the stories mingle, the harder it is to know where you stand. Um, we, we draw on both traditions in order to write. On page 105, uh, he speaks of the impossibility of drawing exclusively from one tradition. Quote, we find ourselves in the open space of powerful yet discontinuous insights, suspended between two works of poetry in the gap where no set of rules applies. And then finally, another quote, uh, at a loss we must then find our own new and imperfect words by which to speak of God who is both present and absent, who hides but can be recollected and become present again. Um, so that gives you a taste of also the, the beautiful uh, rhetoric of, of the text. But this leads me to uh, a number of questions that uh, Frank has heard me uh, ask, I think, uh, in the past. 
and, and my first question is, is whether this disorientation of the theologian is truly inevitable. Um, the way uh, he raises that in, in this text and also in others is that if you do comparative theology, you cannot but be pulled out of your tradition and no, and, and no longer find a particular uh, place to stand. Um, a second question is then, who does the comparative theologian talk to? Who is his audience, her audience? Who are uh, the critical readers of, of the comparative <coughs> theologian? Who are the recipients of comparative theology? Um, so there is some talk in comparative theology of creating new communities of, of uh, like-minded comparative theologians who work in the same traditions and understand each other and then form sort of new communities of reflection and practice. And that's one way of, of doing it, I suppose. But um, my approach to theology, at least, is that, that it's essentially a confessional discipline and I have a very narrow narrow-minded understanding of what confessional means is as speaking to a particular tradition and bringing in uh, something new from outside but but speaking to the tradition out of which one comes and uh, to which one returns and so I I have I you know I've come to an understanding of Frank's approach to comparative theology indeed as a as a kind of intensification or, or reinforcement of the beliefs of one's own tradition. And that's certainly, I think, an, an important aspect of comparative theology. But my question next, and, and what I hope comparative theology is also about, is then bringing back everything one has learned and saying what is new and different and what, uh, what can uh, enrich the tradition from which one comes. So. Um, that's sort of, a, I think, a task of the comparative theo theologian towards the community in which he or she stands uh, that I think is also an important uh, contribution. On the other hand, again, in this book I felt more than in any other books the, the idea or, or, or his understanding of comparative theology as really a, what intensification means. It, it really has to do with the truth. It's not just sort of random choosing, but it has to do with the tr truth of what, uh, what the, this comparative theologian and the tradition believes, and just seeing that truth reveal itself in different ways in different traditions is, is itself, I think, a form of, of enrichment insofar as it adds and indeed intensifies one's understanding of one's own faith. Um, so, nevertheless, still the kinds of questions about where the theologian stands or uh, that kind of lonely place of the theologian, of the comparative theologian that I wanted to raise up. And then secondly, um, and related maybe, uh, has to do with the effect of comparative theology. Um, so comparative theology is still regarded with some suspicion uh, by traditional uh, theologians as a discipline that is maybe uh, dangerous because it leads to, uh, or it, it has the potential to lead to relativism and pluralism and all the isms that the church regards as, as dangerous or most confessional traditions regard as dangerous. Um, and in all of Frank's work, and here again, um, Frank uh, insists that, uh, quote, reading to text increases rather than attenuates the uncompromising devotion deeply rooted within a particular tradition. That's in the introduction. Um, so the term intensification is, is one that, that returns several times uh, in the text. Um, and on page 126, uh, at the end of the book, again, it said that this doubling of memories intensifies rather than relativizes the deep yet fragile commitments of our singular first love. So again, the idea of intensification. So I, I certainly uh, resonate with that and identify with that, but I have a question about what kind of language it is when we say that that is what is happening. Is this like is this a, a descriptive language that we are using? Is this theological language? Is it prescriptive language? Because it's it is indeed possible that by reading two texts and finding similar themes side by side, uh, the effect of such reading can be kind of relativizing, 
and uh, historicizing, purely historicizing a particular text. So I can very well imagine that n not everyone has their faith intensified or amplified and reinforced by reading different traditions side by side. So I, I think there is more to be uh, said, f I mean, about how this, how this intensification happens. Under which conditions uh, does this comparative theological reading indeed lead to, lead to an intensification of one's own commitment and faith and, and, uh, and belief? And does it always lead to this, or under what conditions would it not lead to this kind of experience of intensification? So I like the term intensification. I think it works for people uh, who are involved in the, in the exercise of comparative theology. I think it's, it's important for us to start thinking about uh, whether and how and why that actually happens. And so that's another point I just wanted to raise uh, coming out of the text. But, Again, you probably can tell that I was very moved by this text and, and really recommend it to all of you if you haven't read it yet. So thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Cornelia. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our colleague uh, tonight, uh, Kimberly Patton, as the second respondent. Kimberly, as you know, is professor of uh, the Comparative and Historical Study of Religion here at Harvard Divinity School. Her AB, AM, and PhD all are, are all from Harvard. Uh, professor Patton specializes in ancient Greek religion and archaeology, uh, with research interests in archaic sanctuaries and in the iconog iconography of sacrifice. She also teaches in the history of world religions, offering courses in cross-cultural religious phenomenology. These comprise ritual studies, the mythology of natural elements, religious art and iconoclasm, the interpretation of dreams, animals, and religion and myth, ritual weeping, material holiness, angels and, angel and angel angelology, and funerary cult. Um, Professor Patton's latest book, Religion of the Gods, Ritual Paradox and Reflexivity, published by Oxford in 2009, won the 2010 American Academy of Religion Book Award for Excellence in Religious Studies in the Analytical Descriptive Category. Uh, she has another book underway, but her pre other previous books include The Sea Can Wash Away All Evils, published by Columbia in 2006, and A Communion of Subjects, Animals in Religion, Science, and Ethics, also published by Columbia in 2006. Kimberly, it's great to have you there. Thank you, Kevin. Absence, risk, peril. These are the existential conditions, the unstable raft on a night sea to which comparative theologian Frank Clooney invites us in his hiding place is darkness. This lyrical, contemplative, and also shocking book is different, as Professor Cornell said, in so many ways from any of his previous scholarship. In fact, it is downright steamy. <laughs> Yet it also clearly represents an underground tributary of that river, one of which we were unaware, one that has thankfully surfaced at last. Beauty it brings with it, but also danger for reasons I will explore briefly this evening. The book is an extended devotional exercise that Clooney refuses, as he told us, to present safely as chapters, instead deploying the form inspired by von Balthasar's theodrama to read the third century BCE Shira Hashirim, Song of Songs, and its Latin Christian Vulgate form of the Cantica Canticorum, next to the Tiruvai Mori, or Holy Word of Mouth, of the 9th century CE South Indian Tamil saint poet Namalvar, whose name, Alvar, as Stephen Hopkins reminds us in his recent review of the book in the Journal of Vaishnava Studies, evokes one immersed or drowning in God. And drowning us, to some extent, seems to be Clooney's aim, or at least breaking up the interpretive distancing raft to which we, as intellectuals, might cling, 
Tossed in the dark sea in this book, at least we are in the heart of it, and not able only to just be content with describing it. These are two erotic songs sung by nameless individual women, heartbreaking in their beauty and despair, their frantic searching, and the agony of their remembrance of the ecstasy of union with the beloved, agonizing because he has gone and the light has gone with him. Woven into a lush tapestry of natural imagery set in Jerusalem and South India, respectively, these songs of yearning by powerless women for powerful, blessed, yet somehow careless male lovers who come and go, but who at the time of singing are absent perhaps forever, haunt us. The singers do not know where he is gone, and neither do we. Whether the wandering bridegroom, the God of Israel, Jesus Christ, or Krishna, Lord of the dark rain clouds, even the birds cannot help. Good dark love birds, will you help? Won't you help? He helps, protects, nourishes the seven worlds. Then why doesn't he help me, even despite my deeds? If you see that Narayana, O oh, lovely little heron, stalking your prey in the garden, where streams rush like the tears streaming from my eyes, grace me by just a word from him. The contemporary comparative scholar of religion immediately notes the further similarities of these texts in that they are not only both songs whose roots are in secular love poetry, in the case of the Tiruvaimori, Tamil songs of love and of battle that may date as early as the first century CE, or in the case of the Song of Songs, surely with its breasts better than wine, never originally composed as an allegory for the love of God for Israel, or for the love of Jesus for his church. Each was written by a male author in the voice and consciousness of a woman who has been ravished and left behind by a male beloved, one who seems unaware or unconcerned, both with her feelings and her well-being, even as she longs for him, weakens and threatens to die, or exposes herself to risk. He has consumed my life. Little by little, my lovely body is losing its radiance, which time and again she rationalizes. But still, may this bliss spread, climax, and everywhere flourish. Each female protagonist sings in a kind of stichomathia with a chorus of other women, the gopis of Krishna, the daughters of Jerusalem, of the Song of Songs. Both are taken up into the scriptural canons of their respective traditions, then radically theologized and sublimated. The dark young man of Shira Shirim, hair dripping with myrrh, becomes God, becomes Jesus. The earlier Tamil warrior becomes Krishna. The dark Shulamite becomes Israel, or later in the Zohar, the Shekhinah, the Malkut, then in the church, becomes the bride of Christ. Although he invites us to read these two poems through the rich palimpsests of commentarial traditions of the 12th century Cistercians, Bernard of Clairvaux, Gilbert of Hoyland, and John of Ford, and on the Sri Vaishnava side of Nanjiyar Nampile, or Periyava uh, Chanpile, as well as in the interplay of the, with the poetry of Jory Graham and other writers, Frank wants to invite the reader into a much more implicated position a much more dangerous position. As von Balthasar makes clear in his first volume, Seeing the Form of the Glory of the Lord, before the beautiful, no, not really before, but within the beautiful, the whole person quivers. He not only finds the beautiful moving, rather he, is, he experiences himself as being moved and possessed by it. The fields of religious, and theology, religious studies and theology these days are extremely fond of instability, or better, of intentional critical destabilization of received ideologies that seem to oppress religious narratives, inflected as they often are by cruel prejudices, anachronistic biases, made masquerading as theological ultimates. These, one often reads and hears, need to be unmasked. While all this justifiable problematizing, queering, and destabilizing is accomplished, and when it is accomplished, though, what lies beneath? What is left, for example, for the feminist reader of these texts? What is left 
for the scholarly reader of these texts, what is left for the believer? First, what is left for the feminist? To put it more simply, can we distance ourselves from the direct agony of the loss of the beloved by noting that these poems written by men celebrate a kind of female love that today might only be described as codependent and pathological, <laughs> as accepting the unacceptable? For whom in world literature is usually written out of the male imagination is love lethal for women, Madame Bovary, Madame Butterfly, the archetypal women loved and left abandoned who often destroys herself. The women who are physically and emotionally abused and will not exchange their loves for ones that are healthier or more functional. Functionality and balance are not really big in mystical traditions. I had not consented, but he came and consumed my life. Day after day, he came and consumed me altogether, except for serving my lord in southern Katkarai with its dark rain clouds. Is there anything else that my dear love could enjoy? Or consider the dangerous escape of the singer of the Song of Songs into the city at night. I opened the bolt of my door to my beloved, but he had turned aside and was gone. My soul melted when he spoke. I sought him and found him not. I called him and he did not answer me. The woman of the Shira Shirim and the Cantica Cantorum does insane things. She searches for the lost bridegroom at night about the city. The consequences to her are disastrous and resemble rape. The keepers that go about the city found me. They struck me and wounded me. The keepers of the walls took away my veil from me. Of this passage about the lengths to which a human being the human imagined by a male devotee, the woman, will go for the sake of the one she loves. Gilbert of Hoyland makes these violent city keepers into painstaking physicians, as Frank writes about, who search out the various affections of spirits and discover the passions and good qualities of each and the disease under which each labors. No one's thought escapes their search. Nothing is left but her desire, beyond, as Frank notes, of Gilbert, any pretense reminding us of Oral's bitter speech with its deep roots in her love for her sister Psyche, repeated trance-like and compulsively before the assembly of the gods in C.S. Lewis's Till We Have Faces. Joy of words, joy of words. When that speech is finally dug out of you, you'll not talk about joy of words. Until we have faces, why should the gods listen to the babble that we think we mean? This speech in the case of the Shulamite is, where is he, where has he gone? Interestingly, this move of Hoyland's closely resembles that of Nanjiyar, one of the medieval Sri Vaishnava commentators, who, as Hopkins notes, explains this agony of absence in terms of sickness and cure, just as a physician will forbid a sick person to eat anything. So the Lord wants to bring the saint, the narrator, Namalvar, who has adopted this female persona, to health through a curative withdrawal. But this move, Cluny seems to say, while admirable, should not console us, nor dissuade us again from drowning in that dangerous sea. God's absence and the absence of the human lover can be conflated not only in the hearts of women, socialized to construe their identities through relationships rather than through work or other forms of identity building, but universally. And that is the reason that Shakespeare can use the same language of disease, of yearning, of sickness, in Sonnet 147. My love is as a fever, longing still for that which longer nurses the disease, feeding on that which doth preserve the ill, the uncertain sickly appetite to please. My reason, the physician to my love, angry that his prescriptions are not kept, hath left me, and I desperate now approve. Desire is death, which physic did accept. In other words, the, this world, as Rumi puts it, not just for women, is the slaughterhouse of love. We need not police this pathology, this view of love as a disease or as a, a yearning that can destroy its bearer uh, as only a woman's experience. It is a universal experience and indeed, it can also describe our experience of the beloved God who, as C.S. Lewis reminds us, is not our uncle. Namalvar, the saint in this case, becomes again 
in a mystical devotional move, just like a young woman who suffers greatly, as Frank puts it. In the Islamic Sufi tradition, we're reminded that God is a dar, he is the distresser. He is the one who imposes obstacles. He is the one who removes them. What is left for the scholar? What about their commentaries and their sublimation? Is this a refuge from the possession by them that Frank recommends? We are all familiar with, and perhaps too enamored of, the rhetoric of both scholarship and of theology that so fastly lifts up the spiritual productivity of the loss of the beloved as some kind of lemonade out of lemon for the ages. There can be no question that the absence of God produces great ascesis of the heart and often a profound reorientation to existence itself, offering the bereft a teleology where none was before, making great poetry. It was not until Shams left that Rumi began to turn and to recite, and not until his death that he began to utter the Mathnawi. Dante Alighieri uh, Dante glimpsed the real Beatrice in the streets of Florence only once or twice, but let us rejoice in her unattainability and in the yearning of the poet informed by the conventions of courtly love that resulted in her emplacement in his trial level cosmos as muse and guide. Had she loved him in return, had they married, so the unspoken wisdom goes, their love would have run its domesticated course, she would have grown middle-aged and fat and died in childbirth, and the world would have been robbed of the divine comedy. <laughs> Perhaps so. Human love attained, mystical union attained rather than denied, perhaps is less interesting, perhaps is less productive, perhaps becomes attenuated, prosaic, or in the human case, so the endocrinologist tell us, tells us, loses its hormonally fueled sexual heat in around 18 months at the outside. <laughs> but how often does a husband begin to fail at the death of a wife and perish soon after? What about our students who are suffering through breakups during reading period? We pat their hands, we give them Kleenex, we assure them that they will survive, and we know this. We know this in our seasoned wisdom, except that once in a while one of them does not know this and kills herself. What is left out here in a safe commentarial distance is the lethal loss of love, the way it deprives of the soul of purpose. And this can be true of a human lover as it can of the divine beloved. Frank does not shy away from this reality. What is left for the believer finally? At a loss, Cluny eloquently writes, we are possessed of no neat resolution to the drama of a beloved who hides from us no matter how deep our faith it is not that tradition no longer matters. On the contrary, this problem is primarily for those who still find God in particular traditions and remain content where they have found before. If we are Christians, it is our love for Jesus that makes it so unsettling to hear of her love for Krishna. It is because we love that our love risks losing its innocence and purity. A Sri Vaishnava may still think that the woman of the holy word is the only one who really knows where to find the beloved Krishna. And it will be this believer, firm in faith, who is most likely unsettled by that woman's search for him in the song's night. Familiar religious answers. The beloved is to be found just where he was found before. His absence is our fault. He is returning any day now. May seem pale assurances, writes Frank Clooney, besides the rich testimonies of these women, so stubborn in their longing. But even, he says, if the flood of poetry and these troubled dramas are too much for us, we need not turn back or let go of the intense specifics of love. It is better that like these women, we keep returning to desires that inflame just one particular love over and again. If we have been reading well, their search will then be ours, the intensely present beloved, who is at the same time the absent beloved, the singular beloved who is elsewhere too. We then have all the more ways, to, all the more to seek ways to draw on both traditions in order to write in truth and in love's dark night with a certain patience for the unerring and precise determinations of love intensely imagined by the memory of other loves. What is beautiful and dangerous here in this book is the experience of the absence of God by which both poems and Clooney demand we allow ourselves to be possessed. But I would submit that in this ferociously utilitarian age, uninitiated and insatiable in its thirst for meaningless data, Few people, other than what mystics and madmen remain unmedicated among us, will not be destroyed by the absence of God. 
We may despair at our core, but there is always survival to be attended to, as well as the social framework by which we are all insidiously formed, constrained, and defined, with its blind momentum toward what seems like very practical, even redemptive end, ends, very justified ends that may mean little to us personally, but from which we are afraid or unable to loosen ourselves. The endless anxiety about the production of our lives and our good causes into books or platforms of social media, for example, lest our work not be impactful. But what about the absence of the one whom we love for so long with every cell of our being, the one whose soul was intertwined with our own, the one without whom we thought we could not live? Through its insistence on this Balthazar-like possession by divine absence, not only the kind that dwells in shrines and commentaries, but the kind that is refracted through particular embodied love, the kind that awakes us in the middle of the night. Clooney's book will not allow its reader to be safe and to retreat. This is the absence to which he invites us, one without pale assurances. Thus, as a comparativist, one might argue that he radically sets aside the phenomenological goal of epoche, bracketing specific entanglements, histories, and viewpoints when considering two devotional poems, two voices, two gods. I want to welcome in conclusion Frank's acknowledgement that, quote, loving God is always a risk. There is the particularity of loving Jesus, but this safe love for a celibate Jesuit priestly author draws us, as he writes in his epilogue, perilously near to other such loves. And it is this particular human love that has captured our own hearts, transfigured them and our lived experience in the way that only love can, and perhaps burned those hearts alive in our chests when those loves withdrew or were lost to us. Those mirroring loves and losses refract the absence of God. They become one and the same. As Clooney puts it, we need to find words that rule out mere absence and presence, loves unshadowed by ambiguity, and theories about love and language that drain the vitality of both of them. The gap between what she expects and what does not happen is meant to bother us. Twice implicated, we cannot unread what we have been reading so vividly, and so we are caught. Perhaps for a moment we cannot neatly imagine the separation between the Hindu and the Christian and can no longer say exactly who is the beloved for whom we are searching. Absence, risk, peril. This is a very dangerous place to stand or to drown, but it is a real one. Deprived of the safety of spiritualization, or some kind of rejection of the human experience because of multiple gendering or sexualities that may not exactly correspond to our own. This is the danger of encountering God. We must somehow live in the absence of the beloved, the one who led us to God, the one through whom God shone for us, the one who is now gone or hidden despite our searching. We must somehow live and not die. There is a cure for our longing and only one, and that of that we cannot be certain, and that is his or her return. As Rumi said, when you come back inside my chest, no matter how far I've wandered off, I look around and see the way. At the end of my life, with just one breath left, if you come then, I'll sit up and sing. Thank you. So uh, our, third, our third respondent tonight, Jory Brand, the poet here at Harvard, uh, was not able to come. Um, apparently she did decide the world needed one more poem, uh, after all. And, uh, but she did write a, uh, uh, an email to Frank, uh, which uh, I'd like to read now. Dear Frank, I'm sorry to have been out of touch so long. A poet wrote that. <laughs> Your book moved me deeply. Uh, I thought it was extraordinary. I normally hesitate tremendously before reading anything about my work, but I was truly enlightened by your thinking, for which I thank you with all my heart. Sometime at another time, we must meet and discuss life in person. I would very much like 
to attend your conference, but worried that I might not be able to make our schedules correspond. And she goes on and explains why. This has nothing to do with the work, however, your work, which is truly amazing and surprising. I've loaned your book to quite a few people, particularly people involved with poetry and theology, and it really seems to be a breakthrough to many. M much affection, Jory. So thank you, Jory. Um, and with that, I want to invite Frank up first to respond to our respondents. I think it's appropriate that um, with a book with his hiding place is darkness that the poet is hiding and, <laughs> and perhaps somewhere else in the building, so we'll find out. I'd like to thank with all my heart Catherine and Kimberly for their wonderful responses. Um, it's so nice to have people respond, raise important questions, but with such sensitivity and such a sense of um, having worked in the book and kind of gone through it, so I appreciate that very much for both of you. Just a few comments, because I think we'd love to hear from everybody else. Um, beginning with, I think, Kimberly's points, maybe that would be first. First of all, thank you for filling in information about names and dates and so on like that. I appreciate you doing that. But among the things, the many important things you say, and you say them so beautifully, um, the issue of gender, the issue of the portrayal of the woman, um, it's one of those things I worried about and said, well, I'm not gonna write that book. Um, and it's so easy to say, well, who are you to, to write about this as if this is some exalted state of the abandoned woman, the woman who's desperate. Um, how can you possibly write that way? And I, I think what I was trying to do is say, well, this is not exemplary. It's not telling us the way things are, but it's rather saying, here's an opportunity. You can go in through this door and you can see what happens. So what happens if you enter a drama and you know all about what the problems are and you know the, the limitations of the era and you know the distorted nature of all these forms and so on? But nonetheless, it's Shakespeare, it's uh, Sophocles, it's Kalidasa, it's the poets that we're reading. Go in there and see what happens. And that's a tricky thing because in some ways that works or it doesn't work. Um, there's a kind of sanctioning of stereotypes and gender roles that are unacceptable, unacceptable to us, but nonetheless going there and seeing what happens. I think that works. Um, you mentioned also, Kimberly, the, you know, the, the, the lack of the scholarly epoche here and the, to just plunge right in. As I said, the, one of my strategies was let's shift all of that to the footnotes and let's put that in the back of the book for people who want to have that experience of reading back and forth. And it's a dangerous thing, and again, is, is this um, a scholarly book or not? And in some ways, you know, I did my translations, checked the Latin texts, did this, did that, did that, tried to read around the text, everything that was of some relevance to what I was doing. But the kind of immersion in it, getting entangled in it. Uh, one of the more recent reviewers I read is, a, you might say, a hardcore Indologist, and I mean that as a compliment. Um, a hardcore Indologist who said uh, interesting things about the book, um, but also said at the end, however, it is not advised that you should read this book unless you want to get entangled in it. And I think, she, and I think she's writing for an Indological audience. Don't go there if you're expecting simply information about the ninth century in South India or something like that. And that, that I think, is part of what you're saying. But, and that's all fine and good, but as you say, as we you know, um, counsel our students, talk to our students about the pressures of the semester, and then one tries to take his life or her life. It's not funny anymore. And the idea that these ideals of desperation can be held up, but of course, you know, we're play acting. Um, the epoche can be very valuable of saying, you've got to step back from this. You can't just go down that mad path. And I think, thank you for pointing that out as well. Um, for the believer, I really do think that the believer, this book is meant, I'd like to say for believers, but not only for believers. Uh, which is a hard thing to be able to, to say. But nonetheless, that um, it's the believer, the one who has memories of love, the one who's been there before, who is in the position to be unsettled by this, not the person for whom God is entirely present all the time, absolutely predictable there, or the person who has moved to a different mind and, and no longer understands that language at all. 
but it's the person who has and has lost, who has lost and has not given up. And that kind of believer willing to enter into the, the difficulty, not being complacent, that's, that's what it's about. And I would turn with that, and thank you again, to what Catherine is saying. Um, and first of all, this point about who's the audience of this book. Um, you do say, you know, I'm talking about its intensification. It's a way of overcoming the problem of relativism. Uh, it's a way of um, resisting a kind of flattening pluralism. But as you say, it, it, am I describing the situation the way it is, or am I wishing it was that way? Um, to some extent, I, I'm kind of, again, enchanted by the poetry. You, you conjure something out of nothing, and you say it. And if you say it, interestingly enough, then it's true. Um, now, this is not on every level convincing. But the idea that, no, if you really do this properly, it doesn't take away. It does take away, but it gives you back more intensely than you had before. So it's, it's not at all relativism. It's not at all uh, kind of a flattening pluralism. For that to work, I'd like to think that the safeguards of, of tradition are there. That's why I stress in the book and what I said before, reading with readers in the tradition uh, who want you entirely in their world. The, the Bernard of Clairvaux has no time for Hinduism, if he even knew about it. Uh, he didn't know about it. But if he had known about it, it wouldn't be any room. And Nanjir, Nam Pillai, Perivachan Pillai, uh, they have no room for a Bernard of Clairvaux. I mean, these are worlds that entire, you can spend your entire life going deeper and deeper and then be born again if you're on the Hindu side of the line and do it again the next lifetime. There's nothing else. And yet, I think in a sense, it's, say, it's the person who's like that who should be able to care in this fashion. And that's why, again, I'm, I'm playing with fire when I use von Balthasar. That if you're in a Catholic world, you can say that, playing with fire by using von Balthasar. Um, <laughs> because in some ways, he, he is seen as standing at the other end of the spectrum as the purity of tradition, the purity of the faith, the allegiance to the church, and saying that people don't actually read him very well if that's what they think. And that there's a kind of dangerous element there and the, 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 the pouring forth of yourself into this other situation. I talk at the end of the book about the, you know, falling into silence, um, this, this search that has no predictable ending, the real drama, uh, the giving of the spirit is making this possible. Does this make a convincing case back to a Catholic community? Again, using, you know, uh, the Bible, using Bernard of Clairvaux, using Hans Urs von Balthasar, using Gerard Manley Hopkins, in one way, it reads perfectly as a Catholic narrative. On another level, people can say, oh no, you're not doing it right. And I think my challenge would be, people who say you're not doing it right after they've read the book are people I'd like to talk to. But it's often the case, I know you're not doing it right, so I'm not gonna read your book. And, and, and I think, um, so you're raising a real challenge, and I think some of the people who might be skeptical about this approach probably wouldn't want to do the work of getting inside it. Who is the book for, finally? Um, and again, there's so much I could say about your comments. I'd like to think, again, it, it's for Catholics. Uh, it's for Christians, as people have this problem of who Jesus Christ is or what that means. I'd like to think, by way of analogy, it's for Sri Vaishnava Hindus. Uh, who understand by way of analogy there's something like that at stake in their own tradition. I'd like to think that a larger group of, of believers in different traditions who have, and people have pointed out to me, you could have talked about this, you could have talked about that, other poetries and other mystical traditions where there's the same kind of risk and loss. So spreading circles of it for, for a very much wider audience um, including, and, but this is not for me to say, for people who don't come with a sense, well, I belong to this tradition and I'm risking it at the edge, but have complex traditions, um, had a tradition, have a different tradition, uh, don't believe in the language of tradition anymore, uh, don't believe that there's a lover or a beloved, that it could reach such people, but they would read the whole thing very differently. Um, but I, I, do under, you know, I do appreciate very much that it can't claim to be Catholic comparative theology if it doesn't get received in a Catholic context. And that I think, I mean, you've, you've done a wonderful job tonight in opening that up, but I guess it does remain to be seen in a, in a wider context. And the last thing I'd say is about um, what, what Kevin read it from Jory Graham. 
Um, just that it, it's validating um, that a poet so sensitive about her work as she says hates to read what other people write about it somehow found that this was okay, that this was something that spoke to her work in a, in a way that means something. And I'm glad that, um, although she couldn't be here, that she was willing to, to testify in that fashion. So I think that's all I should say. I'd love to you know, talk about it further, but maybe we could have a further discussion. Yeah, uh, may I invite the two respondents? Frank, why don't you stay up here to yeah. take a seat? And, uh, if people can line up at the front of the aisle, just they have a question that they want to ask you, Who's handling the, should I? No, I oh, okay. This one in the back. Somebody has to start, and I guess it has to be with the least educated person on this in the room. Uh, I'm thinking of this in terms of very simple analogies, uh, analogizing God to a parent or analogizing God to a lover. And if you look at it that way, um, there are times when a parent has to leave a child alone so the child can learn. That isn't breaking or invalidating the child-parent relationship. And maybe it's the same with God. God leaves us alone. He doesn't expect us to think he'll be around all the time. And the same thing for a spouse or a, or a lover. Uh, the relationship is so intense, of course people want to uh, commit suicide when it ends. But one has to at some point realize the deeply beloved can't be there forever and we have to do things on our own. And uh, If the lover has our interests at heart, it would be the first to acknowledge that. Uh, is that simple, practical analogy of any mm -hmm. application? I think so. Maybe if, if, if questions are directed to me, I'll always say something, but then hope that Kimberly and Catherine might also speak if they feel so moved. So we'll keep it in conversation. Um, I, I think you're raising a very good point. And, and certainly in, in Bernard of Clairvaux, Gilbert, and John, there are these ponderings of why it is that these scenes of absence or departure in the song take place. And one is um, sinfulness. One is confusion, thinking that the beloved is gone when the beloved is not actually gone. One is also this kind of therapeutic move. It's good to leave the person to themselves and to step back uh, to allow that to take place, that uh, separation. Um, in the Vaishnava poetry, in the, in the commentators, Nanji or Nambilai and so on like that, some of that element, like she'll say several times, this must be due to my bad karma. And there's also later in the holy word of mouth the element that the Lord pulls back and hides from the beloved so that the poetry will keep coming. Your poetry is so beautiful, if I pull back, you'll do more of it. And that's a different kind of reason. But the final reason I think, or the final thing I'd say is that what they do pick up on in the Turuvaimori, holy word of mouth, is the absolute insistence of this woman almost something like Job's protestations of his, his, right, you know, his right to an answer, is that it's not acceptable that you don't come back. It's not acceptable that you hide yourself. It's not acceptable that other people settle for less and you leave me hanging. So I, I think you're raising a very good point about the different interpretations around this. And some of them are talked about very eloquently, and others, I think, maybe are only partially in this sermon or that sermon or that comment or that comment. But thank you for getting us started. Um, I, I think my voice is loud. No, <laughs> we need a further recording. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry about that. For posterity. <laughs> I'll get some extra steps yeah. in tonight. Great. <laughs> right. um, yeah. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say that um, yeah, it's absolutely beautiful, and to uh, any human, and a believer, 
um, or otherwise, just on so many levels. Um, I gave a presentation and there were several scholars from India there and they were talking about how certain people um, who are from the West are acceptable and certain uh, ones are not acceptable in the way they view uh, Indian texts or Indian scholarship. And when I mentioned your name, Frank, they said, oh, no, he, Frank, Frank Clooney, he is, you know, you're kosher. They didn't say kosher, <laughs> but they didn't say kosher, but basically, yeah. you're in and you understood and you don't count as an external observer. You understand from within and you're accepted from within. So that's a compliment to you in terms of uh, anything you look at. I think you have a deep empathy for any text and, and that lens is, uh, Thank you. shines through. Thank you. Thank you very much, you're most kind. I would just say one thing about that is that I think you know, when we write something, whether we're you know, poets or not, we are often very intensely into what we write and we're often very self-conscious. What happens if somebody else read it, reads it? Will they ever get what we're doing? And the idea of, um, you know, of letting go of one's work and giving it to a reader can be a risky process. And so these kind of mutual validations in the sense that somebody else recognizes that you're not insane or you're not speaking such a private language that nobody can understand it can be very powerful. And that's a beautiful thing when that happens for the poet or the scholar, I think. Hello. Um, Professor Patton, uh, you spoke about uh, women being socialized to construct their identity through relationships rather than through work. Uh, and it almost had this tone of maybe that shouldn't be the case, or rather that women aren't, men or other people aren't. Um, so I, w I was curious about that distinction and also about uh, this aspect of relationships and that they are all consuming and that there might not be room for constructing identity in other ways. So something that I'm curious about is the way that, uh, is how relationships might compel someone to do work in the world um, or how itself in order to be healthy might be related to relationships that a person has with ideas, with people. And so related to that, I had a question for Professor Clooney about uh, how, if, if you are comfortable sharing, how your own devotional life uh, compels you, if it does, uh, to do the scholarship that you do. Um, sort of speaking a little more of that, about that connection, both within your book, um, but more generally as well. Uh, thanks, Molly. Um, I, I very, very seldom speak about gender um, be because it gets thorny really quickly. Okay, so don't write me emails, everyone. I'm just okay. It's 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 hard to avoid in this book, and um, and so I appreciate what Professor Clooney said that he had some trepidation as well because it's so complicated. It's a woman, women's voices. They're representing an archetypal, desperate woman who has lost herself in a relationship in love to the point that she is obliterated. And, um, but it's being written by men um, with a specific spiritual, um, at least in the case of Namlavar, a specific spiritual allegorical purpose in mind. Um, not in the case of the Song of Songs, but Namlavar is drawing from an earlier tradition, which is secular, which is not, you know, insofar as anything can be secular in the first century, right? So. My, my point was not to essentialize, but simply to say that, um, yeah, women are, I think, can be socialized to, um, to see themselves through relationship. I don't think this is um, controversial. Uh, it happens throughout many, many traditional societies, and it can be problematic. I didn't mean to imply that the two are mutually exclusive. Far from it. Um, you know, in a healthy, balanced, functional identity, um, anyone um, should should allow work to grow out of relationship and vice versa. My only point is this pathology, although it is lionized in women and perhaps exacerbated and even fetishized in the world literatures, is not exclusive to women. That was my only point. You know, you see it in male voices and male authors as well, and these are male authors, just to, just to complicate things. Um, I, I'm not gonna go on about the neurobiology of men and women, but they are dramatically different 
women have about 1,500 connectors between left and right hemispheres. Men have about three. <laughs> I, I wish I were exaggerating. Okay, so there's a way in which men can compartmentalize the relationships, um, you know, can, can consume um, women. They're particularly prone to it. Don't write me emails. <laughs> okay. This is just, yeah. So, and, and there are variations in every gender and along every sexual and every spectrum. Okay, disqualifier. Um, so, and, and yeah, and women are child rearers and child raisers. So there's a relationality that, um, I'm not essentializing, um, <laughs> that I think can be um, profitably uh, and beautifully kind of, um, Frank talked about it as a portal. I think that's a great way of, of putting it. It's steered into for religious texts. But, you know, religious texts are full of what we would call if we're going to be, you know, all 12-step about it or all, you know, self-help about it. They're, they're pathological. That's what they are. But that's, I'm not sure, the most helpful way of looking at them. So I'm not sure it's probably a great index for us to judge how, how we should live. I'm just trying to say part of the human experience, very much so, and let us see it through that lens um, rather than re being reactive about it. Um, but I did want to acknowledge um, just the, the thing that Frank and I were speaking about, about the, the fact that it's despair and it is desperate. So I don't know if that helps, but. And I would say, it's a, you're asking a very um, difficult question because it um, both becomes very personal. So I'd say two things, and we could talk about it some other time. One would be, um, I, I really do think the tradition you come from matters and what you grew up with. So I was 17 when I entered the Jesuits, became a seminarian, and right from the start, so you know, pushing 50 years ago, there was a sense to be an intellectual, to be a scholar is a holy vocation. And that it was part of the hype, you know, Jesuits are always smarter than other people, et cetera. <laughs> but it was also the sense, um, this is what you're meant to do. This is what God wants you to do. So it's not enough to be a priest. It's not enough to be a Jesuit. If you can, you should be a scholar. And there's this, a, a sense of intensity about that, that you're not going to be Mother Teresa. You're not going to be Mahatma Gandhi. You're not going to be Daniel Berrigan as peace protester, anti-nuclear activist. You're not going to be all these other wonderful people who do wonderful things. Your job is to shut up, sit down, and do your work. And so that's it was drilled into me from an early age. And what that means practically is that um, even in the academic setting, it's always a matter of what Jesuits call discernment. That there's, there's not a sense you can just figure out your work rationally by reading around the literature and deciding what the next project is. And it's not a mystical thing where you know, God appears to you in the night and says, here, write this. Um, it could happen, but it doesn't happen to me. <laughs> but rather, you're constantly like sifting through um, you know, the grain and the weeds and the, the, the wheat and the chaff. And you're constantly looking around and you're reading a ton of stuff and you have thousands of books and you have millions of ideas coming from your students and colleagues. And, and you're looking kind of like for a thread or something through it that you can find your way. And books are about finding that thread and spinning them out over time. So what I do all the time between books, and I'm doing it now because I'm working on another book, is endlessly write myself notes. I'm always writing notes and always jotting down ideas. And a lot of them, you know, read them two or three days later and just throw them out. But, but some of them stick and some of them come back. And then that sort of becomes, well, that's where it goes now. That's like the, the, the quest, the vocation goes in that direction. So it's kind of a, it's a spiritual discernment, but requires like the maximum attention of your intellect as well as I mean, physical attention too to find your way to the next project. I think it helps my, you know, if, if early in the morning when it's still quiet before I check my email, sometimes I get utter clarity about what to write next. And it's just because I think, you know, at that time of day your mind is clearer. So those are kind of not quite connected ruminations about how this is both academic, intellectual, and a deeply kind of spiritual searching for something. So if you want to ruin any hope of contemplation or productivity, just check your email first thing <laughs> in the morning, and that will wreck, wreck it. Yep. Yeah. So, right? Yes. <laughs> Hi. I haven't read your book, um, but I'm 
very excited too. I love the way that you invite um, the lover or the learner to instead of hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, to open up your eyes, open up your ears, and be happy to speak about you know what you experience. So I'm really excited to um, read your book. So I just want to thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, Kimberly and Professor Clooney always bring me back to the Divinity School year yeah. after year. Um, question, uh, I want to reverse the question the other way around. So we talk about, you know, how does your faith uh, inform your uh, comparative theology and uh, your scholarly work? What about the other way around? When you face the believers, the congregation, how does the work that we do here on a more academic plane inform how you speak to the everyday believer? Um, do you tell them about the things we talk about here? And uh, do you tell them about the studies and the books you write and so forth? Mm. I've always been curious about that yeah. because I've only seen you on this <laughs> side, in this setting, and yeah. um, I've always been curious about the other side. I think all three of us could answer that question. Yeah, so, please. Um, let me take a try first, um, and then pass it over to you. I, I mean, I think one of the, 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 the there's so much kind of verbiage, and so many um, stray ideas, and so many mixed signals that a preacher <laughs> pulpit can put before people, and there's so many kind of banal confusions, like taking an occasion and ruining by by saying aimless, silly things. That I think part of the discipline of being you know, a teacher, if you're a teacher for a long time and you have the privilege of interacting with your students a lot, and if you're trying to write and trying to, you know, cut out all the excess stuff in your manuscript, then when you have those rare moments in temple or church or wherever you happen to go uh, for worship, if you have a community, then part of it is to clear the ground and to, to not say the things that are pointless or needless or useless and get to the point. So like when I preach in a parish on the weekend, I rarely ever talk about Harvard, rarely ever talk about uh, South Indian Hindu poetry, rarely talk about <laughs> my books. Um, but what I try to do is uh, you know, strip away the clutter on top of the gospel and just get to what exactly is the point of this for this congregation this day. And I think there's kind of an analogous, analogous um, work underway of what's the point? What exactly are you trying to do? Uh, what is this reading saying to us? And going there, and helping people to go there. And the fact that I know so much about Hinduism all these years, I think makes me realize much of what we'd say about Christianity isn't particularly Christian, isn't particularly unique, isn't particularly interesting. So don't say any of that. Um, <laughs> find the one thing that you have to say that can't otherwise be said and go there. I can actually talk about Frank from both sides because <laughs> I'm in that congregation where he goes on Sunday and says mass and does his sermon. So I feel like a privileged witness to both sides. Um, but I think what you're saying is, is absolutely true. There's never any mention of, uh, of any kind of uh, expertise in the uh, uh, study of Hinduism. But I think what, what strikes me indeed is, is always sort of bringing out, and it's never one point, by the way, it's always three or four points. <laughs> but bringing out sort of the essence of a text and, and relating it to the broader context also and relating text to each other within the Bible. So I think you're a master really at that sort of really, really close reading of the text and seeing the, the relevance indeed for the, for the context today and being able to draw the broader implications really from very close reading of the text. So, you know, that's, that, that's certainly my experience. Yeah. But you yourself must do, find yourself doing this in all kinds of, I mean, you know, I mean Boston College, well, I, I mean, you're the professor, you're the chair of the department, but you also then are dealing in classroom with students looking for some message. Right, yeah. But I think, I mean, there's less dichotomy in, in my experience between being sort of a pastoral figure and being a, an academic. Yeah. So in that sense, I think it bleeds all more into one another than, than maybe 
is the case uh, for you. But, but yeah, I think in, in our life in general, when we relate to other people um, and the, the kind of wisdom we learn from other religious traditions, indeed, doesn't have to be illustrated or pointed to to come out in what we say. And I think that's also what Frank is saying. Um, I, I think we all, all of us, whether we're here, you know, in, in the academy or whether we're in a church or a mosque or, or a shul or a, a temple, are we're inheritors of the human religious heritage. So um, when I'm asked to speak, you know, in Orthodox Christian circles, I, I try not to dumb down what I'm saying because I assume that people don't care about the history or the theological background because I find that, um, you know, even if people don't have an extensive theological education, they are often very reflexive and deep thinkers. Um, and, and I end up learning, and I, I don't say this with false humility, I end up learning as much from them, if not more, probably more than they learn from me. Um, within my own church, I don't really speak um, publicly. Uh, my, my church is like my father's uh, family. They're mostly blue collar. Again, they, um, I find myself learning from them and um, there's a certain uneasiness with like degrees and, and languages, but there is um, reflexivity and thought and theorizing about the tradition and often a lot more knowledge and wisdom um, than I might have. So I feel more like I'm, I'm actually learning from them. I'm there by choice and I'm really um, I'm in more of the position of the, the one who is being taught um, by how they act, by how they understand the tradition. Um, often I'll hear about traditions from them I, or I think theological ideas I've never heard about um, that might not even be in the literature, might not be known um, in scholarship. So I sort of see it more as a continuum um, rather than as two different worlds. I really couldn't function if I saw it as two discrete, separated, policed different worlds. I, I think the permeability is really important. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you and thank all of you for your questions and uh, especially to thank our, our two respondents for their very rich uh, reflections. And above all, to thank Frank, first of all, uh, for giving us some occasion. Uh, to think about this very important, interesting, interestingly constructed book, but also for giving us faculty here at the Divinity School and students uh, a chance to learn about one another's work and to present our own work. Uh, it's a real act of generosity, Frank, for which we're all grateful. Please join me in thanking Thank Frank. You.